Thank you, Sam, for that presentation. Um, a shout out to Charlotte Baker, who's joining us in the symposium. And now I'd like to turn it over back to Dustin Nabheen, the University of Arizona Wildcat, to take you through a Q&A. All right, thank you. I really enjoyed that session. Uh, we have a ton of questions for you guys. Our first question is for Matt. Matt, if you could unmute your mic. Uh, Matt, it's great to see what you guys are doing up in Calgary at the Calgary Sport Institute. You've been an inspiration for us. We had a question on, um, there's this period that they called the dark window, which is after an athlete gets injured and then when they have surgery. And do you believe there are any assessments that are valuable during that time period to guide their rehabilitation? Uh -huh. Uh, you know, Dustin, I, I think uh, to keep the answer short, that's a gap for us. It's not something that at the current time that we have any uh, specific strategies around. Um, but back to the idea of scaling conversations, um, you know, after surgeries have occurred, you know, we do try to get some neuromuscular testing done as, as soon as we can, uh, mostly to begin to scale the oftentimes over potentially overly optimistic outlooks that we might have very early on in the post-surgical period. Um, you know, as we start to look to return to sport, um, that, that is important to us. And, and uh, similarly, I think, uh, you know, getting, getting some data points in and around the injury is key. Um, the last little piece I'll say is that a, a future work for us is, uh, you know, we're looking uh, potentially at some blood biomarkers uh, in and around uh, injury uh, uh, to help guide these sorts of uh, conversations. And, um, importantly, trying to correlate the pathology that we have around ACL injury, so all the associated injuries that occur to to uh, that return to sport timeline and uh, the recovery rate that we we described in the presentation. Thank you, Matt. That was excellent. Uh, Ernie, you brought up some um, some good points about coach buy-in. So initially, it seems like your coach came to you with a question and asked, you know, provided you a task of decreasing the injury rate. And then you talked about how you used uh, videos to get other staff on board. Um, I think I'll kick it over to the other two first, then we'll come back to you if you want to expand on it. Uh, Matt, while you're on, do you want to take that question first? What have you done from a coach buy-in perspective to make sure that your interventions um, are, are used by the, the team effectively? I mean, you know, it's funny, we were just, I was just having a chat about this with uh, one of our, uh, one of our staff, uh, Dr. Courtney Brown, who's actually uh, watching this uh, as well. And, and certainly uh, coach buy-in has been, um, and athlete buy-in has been, has, been has been a huge challenge. It always is a challenge. Uh, the main strategies are obviously around building that initial rapport, uh, build, building that initial trust um, that I think takes time. Uh, so, you know, from a, from, a, from a personal relationship standpoint, I think that's sort of the platform to, to move forward into some of the more um, technical stuff that we're doing. Um, certainly as well, you know, when we've had a few wins uh, with some more uh, complicated uh, situations, uh, the reputation of, of our care and, and, our, uh, and our, you know, putting athletes first has, has also uh, been something that, um, you know, we're continually trying to get better at. So it's that whole thing of, you know, assessing the problem, debriefing so we can get better quickly, uh, because I think that's uh, that's kind of your cornerstone uh, for, for building trust with the coach and, and uh, being able to get the buy-in. And Coach Gardner, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think it's going to be it's going to be tough to get anything accomplished if you don't have a, a good relationship with the sport coach. Uh, as an SNC, ideally, I try to be as present as possible at training sessions and meet with coaches off-site as much as possible to kind of relate to each other more as a human being instead of just coach the coach all the time. Um, so something as simple as a coffee chat, something as simple as grabbing a, a burrito together, uh, which is something I do with the cycling coaches, um, and hopefully just including them in the process so they they know what's going on every single week. Um, and hopefully there's more more buy-in from their end if they're actually educated, like Matt said, on, on what the process is. And hopefully if you could connect as humans, not just coaches once in a while, that usually helps me out a bit with the relationship side of things. So I've interrupted many of Coach Gardner's coffee chats with coaches at our local coffee shop down the street, so I know he's telling the truth there. Uh, Ernie, outside of the video example, what other things have you found effective? It, it's it's unique to each environment. The reality is, like in collegiate athletics, coach buy-in is, is probably more important than the athlete buy-in because in collegiate athletics, in America at least, we get to <laughs> – 
for the most part dictate what the athletes are going to do during those mandatory periods. So they they're, they're kind of at our disposal. And for that reason, I actually feel that collegiate athletics practitioners have to be some of the top practitioners out there. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but we have to be because because gaining athlete buy-in isn't as important because they they just have to do what we say. So that's why the coaches actually act as the they're, they're kind of the CEOs of the sport program. And we do a really good job at Utah with our sports performance teams, the dietitian, the athletic trainers, the physical therapists, the strength and conditioning coaches, the psychologists, the scientists. We all meet at regular intervals to talk and strategize how to maximize health, safety, and performance of our athletes. But all of that's at, at a loss. Like we can do all this work around the athletes, but if we can't get the coach engaged in that process, then I, I think we fall short of all, what we could do. So with the football case, the video was the right option because once we go to practice, you saw those practice plans, we have 10 different position coaches and they're all taking their experience to the table. So how can we get the same message to the coaches? That, that was a really good strategy there. But with a lot of other sports, like for example, with our volleyball team, we meet as an entire group, all the coaching staff operations and all the support services meet as an entire group once a week. And so now it's just, it's just real life conversations and they're frequent conversations. So we formally convene for about an hour a week, talk about all things in the program. So, so in a way, uh, long story short, videos work when you need to give the same message to a lot of coaches and you don't always have that opportunity to provide that message. But in some settings, it, it could just be those formal conversations and building those relationships so that the coaches start to take heed on what the sports performance team is suggesting to maximize the success of the program. Coach Gardner, you've had an interesting career path um, with different sports and in different organizations. Can you talk about how those experiences helped you prepare for coaching adaptive sport athletes? Yeah, I mean, I've been been really fortunate to have had the, the journey I've been on. Um, I think everywhere I've gone, I've been surrounded by great people. Uh, and I've been fortunate to be able to pick people's brains and know a lot more about certain areas than I do. Um, I think having exposure to a variety of sports and, and human performance settings has helped me because any lesson you learn from one sport culture or one athlete can help you with a future athlete or a future coach. Um, and just the whole idea of, of learning different communication tactics and skills and different ways to build relationships um, seems to be a common theme right now in this Q&A, but there's no one, one way to connect with every single person. So being able to kind of draw back on all these different experiences, I think has helped me relate to athletes in different situations better than had I just come from one setting. I also think working with uh, quote unquote holistic teams or high performance teams for the last decade I've been fortunate to learn new ways to connect with staff as well, um, and hopefully learning how to actually build relationships helps with communication, and then that just helps with the buy-in process. So each of you are lifelong learners who started your career in SNC and then have pursued additional education and are continuing to pursuing uh, academic opportunities or different types of micro certifications or um, look, always looking for new skills. Um, can you talk to us about, we're going to go to each of you, but how did your career start and then what made you think I need something else from an education standpoint and why you chased that? Uh, Matt, let's start with you. Yeah, no, thanks for the question, the question Dustin. Um, you know, I think I think the the key for me is that uh, that awareness that, um, you know, we, we throughout our, our entire lives, I think we need to be pursuing, uh, you know, mentorship. And um, I just know that the oftentimes the impetus has been, um, you know, uh, sort of innate things. You know, you're I'm curious. I like to learn more. I, all those obvious, uh, obvious pieces. But there's really an active component that, you know, for me, it, it's about it's about continuing, continuing to seek mentorship and, and knowing that that's a kind of a core value for myself in terms of my own personal leadership. Um, you know, the other thing I would say that that uh, uh, coaches and practitioners may struggle with is that there's times in your career where, you know, you're going wide as a practitioner and, and obviously broad with how we work. And then there's times, if, especially if you want to take a, a more of a research oriented approach where you've got to kind of come narrow and go deep. Um, and, and I've found that another uh, thing that's been helpful in addition to that awareness of always wanting to seek mentorship is 
consciously knowing when I'm uh, in a mode of being wide and when I'm in a mode of needing to go deep because uh, it changes how you think a little bit and, and obviously brings up blind spots uh, with whichever mindset that you happen to be in. Um, but I know for myself, that's um, that's kind of been a, a cornerstone for my career and a theme that keeps coming back up is, is mentorship and, and seeking it out. All right, Coach Gardner, you're on the hot seat. Yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty cliche, but I think every year I learn how much I actually don't know. <laughs> and uh, a lot of my personal interest in learning and education are derived from um, potential problems that we need to solve with athletes I work with. So if it's a, a new sport I'm working with or a new coach I'm working with or a new, new set of athletes, um, there's always kind of unique challenges and situations that I want to educate myself on to better help those individuals that I'm here to serve. Um, so a lot of my personal education and, and uh, continuing continued learning has been kind of derived from me trying to help answer a question or try to solve a problem that was placed before me. Dr. Reimer? Well, for, for me, you know, when I started university, I was a film production major, and uh, that was probably my most advanced skill set as a teenager was my artwork. But I realized during university that I was spending so much more time reading about nutrition and training and training it that the homework was an inconvenience because it was taken away from that study. My favorite book at that time, the first book on training I read was Arnold's Encyclopedia on Bodybuilding. And as I advanced through my career, I discovered strength conditioning. I transferred to northern Arizona, became a lumberjack because they had an exercise science program. I was hired by the U.S. ski team, by their, their sports science department. As the years went by, I mean, in reality, we were only training the skiers consistently for like eight weeks in the summer, maybe if we had eight weeks. And then the rest of the year was about managing all these other things to give them the best chance to succeed during every ski run, which is very expensive, by the way. So... I started to shift my focus towards sports science, realized that I was a crap sports scientist, tried to figure out, say, can I short fast track this? Nope, have to do it the hard way. So I grinded my way through a multidisciplinary PhD. And now here I am in this, I've kind of recreated my career as a sports scientist for U for University of Utah. But, you know, over the past year, I've had a PhD hangover now that I'm done. And now I'm starting to look ahead. Here's what I realized though is that all of us who's here, there's 3,500 people here, we have this tremendous amount of domain expertise. The problem is we don't know how to automate it. The world is run by software and automation. And there is a world in our future where kids right now, in the same way we were taught to write cursive and type on a computer, kids are being taught to develop software. A world does exist when domain experts also know how to develop software. So I'll be starting a, um, uh, a full software development course at 16 hours a week. I'll be a full stack developer by the end of the summer. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I'd say software development's a little unusual for most sports scientists. That's a pretty impressive one to take on, Ernie. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about athletes. We don't know what return to sport looks like yet for the most part. And there are a lot of athletes who are not training or doing workouts in their house or a local park, and then they're gonna be put back into some formal training environment. Do you guys believe that assessments should be in place during the return to training period to help prepare the subsequent training plans athletes are given? Uh, Ernie, while well, you're on, we'll go to you first. Well, absolutely. Uh, first of all, we're, we're heavily constricted in the collegiate environment. The NCAA rules uh, due to liability have prevented us from really supervising any form of workout. And so, yes, the entry assessment for our athletes during our return to place will be critical. And what we're currently going through right now is which assessments are critical and how do we need to adapt the athletes' abilities when they come in to whatever timeline we have to our first competitions. And so it's going to be really critical, but we have to be super strategic because all these athletes are going to flood the campus at one time faster than they ever have in one mass group. So we have to be really strategic about really identifying the critical assessments we need. And most likely we're going to upscale our monitoring efforts and our surveillance efforts to do everything we can to mitigate risk during what will most likely be a very rapid timeline. Yeah, that's a good point. We're pushing our, uh, our monitoring programs really hard right now. So we have some baseline activity level understood as people try to ramp up because it's also a concern of ours. Uh, Sam, do you want to expand on that, the Paralympic population you're working with? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I like Ernie said, I think it's pretty important to, to make sure that we actually go through our formal assessments when athletes come back to not make any false assumptions, uh, to understand where they actually are uh, as best as we can before and knowing where the sport coach wants them and make sure that we have a logical progression along the way. Um, but before I even worry about sport performance right now, um, obviously within para populations, there's a good percentage of the athletes I work with have uh, autoimmune deficiencies or weakened immune system states. So uh, before I just worry about performance, I think it's going to be imperative to make sure that we, we identify athletes who, who might be more susceptible to uh, contracting anything uh, before I just worry about pushing performance parameters. Um, so that's obviously um, kind of priority number one on my list right now with the para populations. Yeah, that's a great point. And uh, Matt, what are your comments from the, the Canadian perspective? Uh, I mean, uh, you know, I'll echo some similar comments as my, my counterparts um, and, and maybe to add a little bit, you know, something different to the to the mix. Um, you know, I'm just really fortunate to have such a, a strong team of practitioners at, at the Canadian Sport Institute Calgary. Um, our, uh, our physio, uh, Isabel Audrick Witt, strength coaches and, uh, you know, um, uh, Courtney Brown, as I mentioned, who's on this call. And so I think, you know, to manage right now, especially with our, our return to sport, uh, uh, cases, uh, we've got athletes coming back from injury. Uh, certainly one key has been over communication. Um, so, you know, we've been, we've been touching base with them in a very strategic way, uh, building out these return to performance training plans for each of the athletes that details not only sort of, I guess the, the, like, like a yearly training plan would for, for a non-injured athlete, but also, uh, layered in this is our communication strategy. So making sure that we're, you know, we've got our touch points planned. We're, we're, we're reaching out in the, in the, in the most appropriate ways. Um, and then the last piece is, um, similar to what's been sort of discussed here is the use of wearables. Uh, been, been working with a company out of Vancouver and, and trying to, um, um, uh, implement, uh, through, uh, sort of a smart insole, um, uh, health check that can be done on a weekly basis with our athletes to be able to look at, you know, walking, uh, jumping and running as they're progressing back after injury. So all of those are sort of layered in right now. Um, and, uh, Certainly, it's uh, it's it's going to be important because I think like we're all seeing is that athletes are at different levels right now, um, and and when we sort of kick back up here, whenever that time will be, um, we're going to need to sort of drill down and figure out where the athletes are uh, physically, mentally, and, and 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 make sure that we're we're meeting them where they're at, and and that we have a sensible progression as they make their way back. So. Um, definitely on our radar, and it's uh, it's something that we're we're attending to, uh, you know, with with. Uh, with, uh, with the technology that's available to us. So thank you, Matt. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Ernie. That was a great session, great Q&A. Uh, we're gonna kick it back over to Charlie, who's gonna take us to the lunch break. Thank you, gentlemen, for that last session and Dustin for the Q&A. Um, just to wrap up uh, before we break for lunch, um, there were a couple questions. I'm gonna just clarify a couple things in terms of questions we received. What is an NGB? Um, in the United States, the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee um, identified by congressional law um, organizations to run sport. So in the United States, U.S. swimming is the swimming NGB for um, the sport of swimming. USA hockey, USA tennis are the NGBs that run those sports. So hopefully that answered your question. Um, question, are the materials going to be shared? Uh, materials that are approved to be shared will be posted to the SPRY uh, YouTube channel in a couple weeks. So approved materials will be shared through the SPRY YouTube channel. And lastly, um, how do we register for next year? We do have dates just in, in Vail next year, April 28th through May 1st. We have everybody's contact information. So once uh, we finalize that, uh, people will be receiving uh, information about how to register for next year's event in Vail. Exciting. Um, a couple things. Reminder, post questions. Post questions. Do I need to remind people? We are Team USA. If you post a question. Okay. Reminder about that. Uh, trivia polling. We'll have two trivia questions. One a medicine question, one a sport question. So please uh, do the live polling for our next two questions. Um, and just a reminder, um, in order for us to expand sport medicine and research capabilities, uh, we're privately funded, so donations are critical. So if you choose to donate, thank you very much. Uh, we have a 25-minute break for lunch, 
Before we break, a shout out to Shohai Miyachi from the Toronto FC Football Club. That is soccer for your University of Wisconsin Badgers on the line that are Green Bay Packer fans. That is soccer, not American football. So everybody enjoy lunch. You have 25 minutes. Thank you.